I will try my best not to fall asleep up here. Um, okay, well, let's uh, dive back in. So I wanted to finish up the cache, and then we'll um, talk about something else. So we talked about this cache design and splitting the functional access from the timing accesses. And this is somewhat similar to what the caches, um, the classic caches in Jim 5 do, um, which I'll talk more about the difference between classic caches and Ruby in a bit. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the event function wrapper again. Um, I think it's, this is really useful to use these um, anonymous lambda functions in order to just schedule some function to execute uh, later. Um, and specifically, you know, we are capturing this in packet so we can use the current object and other local variables um, when we call this. Previously, what would happen before the event function wrapper was added last summer, um, you would have to create a new, like, we created a class for the um, master port and slave port interfaces. And similarly, with events, you would have to create your own event class for like every single event that you wanted to do. But now it, it, it's much easier. Um, and then this is another thing. So in this case here, we're creating a new event to, um, so we're actually here uh, allocating a new event on the heap. Um, but this event needs to be deleted at some point. And so when you pass this true into um, the event function wrapper, when the event executes, it goes ahead and automatically deletes it after execution. So you don't have to worry about memory management um, of your events if you say true here. Um, and I guess the other thing that we hadn't talked about before is, uh, so when we looked at the scheduling events, we were giving it a um, tick to execute at. And there's a nice helper function, clock edge, which will give you the tick of the next clock edge. So if the object has a um, clock domain associated with it, it will automatically give you the tick of the next clock edge, or the clock edge of however many cycles in the future. If you do clock, clock edge of uh, zero, it's the next. Clock edge of one, actually maybe clock edge of one is the next. Clock edge of two is two clocks in the future. So it lets you use um, cycles pretty easily. All right, let's briefly talk about packet construction. Um, so there's lots of different constructors for these packets. Uh, what we saw in the cache is we used the second one to create a packet up that's an entire block size. Um, so I think that this one is relatively commonly used. And then down here, usually you can just call packet create read and packet create write to create your read and write requests um, without having to worry about exactly what command to pass in and things like that. Okay, and then there's one other, a couple other pieces of um, memory management stuff to think about. So these packets have data that flow along with them. So you have to be careful when allocating this data to make sure you don't have memory leaks. Um, you can call packet allocate, which will allocate dynamic data. And that dynamic data is whenever the packet is deleted, the data is deleted. You can also have static data if you're passing one piece of data across many different packets. Then when the packet is deleted, that data isn't deleted, but someone has to delete that data at some point. So you should be really careful of using static data. Then the last thing a packet has, which can be really useful, is um, the sender state pointer. And the sender state allows you to, so say you're a, uh, uh, yeah. What usually you is using? I mean, uh, okay, I can imagine that the static version could be used to do some kind of hint strip buffer structure or something like that, and then you use the positions to do kind of a green book. Yeah, so the static data, it's kind of like if you have, a, let's say you have a read, say so a read packet come in for, um, 128 bytes of data, but you need to split that up into two requests. Rather than allocating two new 64-byte chunks of data, you could pass both those new packets, 
pointers into that 128 bytes of the original packet to not have to do extra memory management. That'd be a use for the static data. And then the new packets would have static data. Yeah, and so then that the original packet that had that 128 byte data, that packet would be in charge of freeing it. So that one would be dynamic, and the two new packets you created would be static. Uh, yeah. So then the sender state is it lets you package up information to send with the packet that then you can get back when the packet comes back. So for instance, in the crossbar, um, this isn't how it works, but it could work this way. You get um, a packet from one of the ports in the crossbar. You send that packet out the, uh, the port that it needs to go out. At some point, you get a response. But then that response doesn't say which port it originally came in on. So you have to somehow remember which port to send it back out. So one thing you could do is encapsulate that in this sender state, add the sender state to the packet, send the packet on. The packet comes back as a response. Then you could pull that sender state back out of it. So it's a way to store local information in a packet that's passed around to other places. And then you can get it back out whenever the packet comes back. Extension. Extension. Right, it's kind of like an extension, yeah. Um, and, and sender state can be whatever you want. Uh, there are a few different times that this is really useful. I think crossbars is this one, although that's not the way the crossbars work. Um, yeah, so pa packets are really useful. OK, and then the last thing is um, whether or not you delete a packet. So if you were making a response, if you get a packet, you satisfy the request, and then you need to respond, you don't delete the packet and then send, make a new packet to respond. All you have to do is call make response. So you use the same packet. You do delete if this is the final place the packet is being sunk. So for instance, a memory write, you just get a write to memory, you do the write, and then you can delete that packet because you don't need to respond to it. Yeah? What if you need to respond multiple times? Let's say there's one packet that comes to you, and then for simulation purposes, you respond over the course of several cycles, one piece of data per cycle. Oh, that's a really good question. I've never run into that. I can imagine you need to refill a cache line, and for whatever reason, your memory system sends you a byte at a time to call the line. So I think the way that I would probably model that is rather than sending a byte at a time, I would send the whole 64 bytes and then add to that a latency that that should take. The thing is I don't want to have uniform latency for the whole response. I want to have different latencies for different words in the response. Huh. Um, that's really always, good. I can always have the receiver model that variable latency, but that seems a little clunky. So in that case, I think you'd have to create new packets. Yeah. And you'd have to have a new packet command type as well for that. But if you say there's only one answer to one request, then you would send several packet, re uh, packet answers to the one request that was made. Yeah, so that would, I, I think that that would probably work. So it I actually, so it would not work in the, cro in, in the crossbars. You could not do that across a normal crossbar because the crossbars expect one request and one response, which are the same packet. Um, but you could do that generally. Like there's, no, there's nothing stopping you in the master-slave interface from sending multiple responses to a request, um, just in the classic cache system. That would be an issue. Do you have to generally explicitly delete things, or do things generally auto pointer? You generally have to explicitly delete. Okay, so, so I thought some of the objects were reference counted, no? Some of them are reference counted. Um, packets are not reference counted. You need to do it. So, so you do delete if you're the final sync. So memory deletes a packet. Um, and you also have to delete the packet if you initiated the request and then you're getting a response. Okay, so, so whoever receives the, res the, the final transfer of the packet is the one who's Right. The right. original requester gets a response, or if there's no response, then it's the receiver. Exactly. Yes. So you do have to delete packets. What if you broadcast multiple So if you broadcast, then you need to create multiple packets for the broadcast. And this is available online in this presentation? Uh, it will be. Um, yes. Okay.
Cool. Yeah. So um, for the cache, uh, all the complete code is available, and the cache, the code we were looking at has statistics in it for like hit and miss and miss latency. It has better flow control than what we were looking at in the simple min object, um, and it also works with the out of order CPU, so it can support multiple requests per cycle um, to work with the out of order. Uh, I think it, oh, well now you're making maybe it doesn't work. I think it works with the O3. I'm pretty sure I tested that, okay. but I could be wrong. The simple mem object definitely doesn't, but I think I made the cache work with O3. I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, you can open an issue on GitHub, because I think it should work with the O3. Okay, so um, we kind of had some time before lunch for this, but any questions about mem objects, packets, the master slave API, or this cache implementation? So, um, if you want to like make a uh, vector vectorized like port, mm -hmm. okay, so you're, you're definitely need something like a data structure to like store like which packet came from which port. Yeah, so I have um, the cache actually has an example of that. So let let, let me show you. Um, so if we look at Learning Gem 5, part 2, cache. So here, the CPU side, we're actually using a vector slave port. And the one port will be for data, one port will be for um, the instruction. And if we look at the config file, Um, so it's actually kind of interesting the config file you just simply say i cache port equals cpu side d cache port equals cpu side any other ports equals cpu side and that automatically gets put into this vector of ports and then um Let's see, get slave port. So if the name of CPU side if the name is CPU side, then we give the return the port of that ID in this case. And then in your for, for your question. Receive timing request. So when we call handle request, we're actually passing in an ID with it. And then we save this waiting port ID here. So I need to look at the code because I forgot how I did it. Um, but so we pass the port ID, which will be either zero or one. Um, and then we save this waiting port ID and we finally get the response. We will send back across whatever port ID is in waiting port ID. Um, and so if you had, like, say, a non-blocking cache in this case, you would need to save this waiting port ID in the MSHR with the rest of the information about the request so you know where to send it afterwards. Um, and you can look at the crossbars for an even more detailed one that has, they have a big map that maps um, packets to ports. So that ID, the port ID, came from um, receive timing request. So this receive timing request, when it called handle request, passed in this CPU port's ID. So let's see. So this, in the, and I guess this is one other detail with, um, Vector ports. So I have a vector of CPU ports now. And for the number of ports that are in that vector, which in this case is just two, for each one of these, I create a new CPU port and then I pass in this ID. So that's where the ID comes from, is all stuff that I did. Yeah, I understand, but uh, you want to use a temporary variable or I don't know what temporary temporary storage to, to store the ID, right? In the yeah. crossbar or in the intermediate yeah. block. 
and then we go to attach to the to the packet. packet. Yeah, so you could do that with like the sender state. You could put that in as part of the sender state. Or even the, 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 the target, the, the receiver could also attach that. Yeah. Um, and there's also IDs for packets, but I think that ID is used for the original sender, so you can track what CPU the request came from originally. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, so back to the, why do you need anything for ID? Because you have instruction data set, right? Can't you like just? Yeah, 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 so, so in this, um, so I wanted to do an example. Uh, so in the simple mem object, I had one port called instruction port and one port called data port. In my, um, so in here, I have an instruction port and a data port in the simple mem object. But then in the cache, just as another example, um, I had one port called CPU side, which is a vector. And so you could do it either way. You, and I think for a cache, it makes sense to have a CPU in instruction. Um, or, yeah. No. In this case, it makes more sense. But what I meant was you could theoretically service both ports like, without waiting. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now in this implementation. Yeah, in this implementation, it's blocking, and okay. you can only do one or the yeah. other. Um, but, but that's really just out of simplicity. Um, but then, yeah, if you wanted to s try to do both, then you would need to add some kind of model for bandwidth. You know, how long is a bank in your cache busy? Kind of thing. Yeah. Or don't model bandwidth. Either one's okay. I've done both. Actually, there's a, um, the paper I'm a co-author on that's being presented here essentially said, Jason's idea was bad because he didn't take bandwidth into account. And I, I didn't model bandwidth in, in one paper. And someone else is like, look, you're wrong. You need to model bandwidth. So <laughs> bandwidth modeling is important. Any other questions? OK, cool. So that finishes uh, the simple cache. Um, so next, I'll take a quick poll. We can either step away from the memory system and talk about CPUs, or we can talk about cache coherence. Who wants to talk about cache coherence now? Who wants to talk about CPUs now? More, way more people want CPUs. So we'll do cache coherence after we've had some coffee. Because I think we need coffee to get in the cache coherent mind space. Right? Um, actually, no, we'll do that after this. OK. Uh, we're going to try to do both before coffee, which we have like an hour and a half. I think it's 3.30 is when our coffee break is. OK. Um, so this is the first time I'm presenting this section, which is unfortunately not written yet in the book. Um, but I have, um, do I have an outline? Yeah. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the ISA works, the different ISAs work in GP in Gen 5. Um, then I'm going to talk about, in a little bit more detail, we're going to go through the code of, I have a learning simple CPU implementation. Um, it's about the simplest CPU you can implement, I think. Um, so we'll go. We'll look at some of that code, similar to how we looked at the cache code, um, and then talk about the different CPU models that are in Gem Five a little bit, and then talk a little bit about full system versus this emulation. Now that we understand how the execution works. Um, cool. Okay. So Gem Five supports lots of ISAs. Um, I did an LS on source. Arch, and I think we have, what is that, eight different ISAs right now that we're supporting. Um, you know, not all are equal well supported. I think someone asked me this question at the beginning, which ISA. Um, ARM and x86 are the best supported. So x86 is pretty well supported because tons of people use it. Granted, not all the x86 instructions are implemented. Uh, most of the SIMD instructions are still not implemented. but x86 is pretty well tested. You can boot Linux with x86 pretty easily. ARM is really well tested, and I would say it's the most stable out of all the ISAs. And this is because there are a number of people at ARM who are using Gem 5 every single day. And they have a lot of faith 
in it. And if the arm people have faith in it, then I have faith in it. Um, we're going to talk more offline if you want to hear about it. a little bit more detail there. Um, yeah, so those two are the best supported. We're just now getting support for Risk Five. Risk Five in SE mode works pretty well. Um, and now that they're finally stabilizing the full system ABI, we should see some full system Risk Five support coming in the next four to six months. I would guess there are people working on it right now. Um, there was actually some patches posted recently to start working on Risk Five full system support. Um, the other ISA is like, I mean, Alpha works well if you can find an Alpha compiler. Um, MIPS, I have no idea what the state of that is. Power, I don't know what the state of that is. Spark, there aren't any chips that exist with Spark anymore, so why would you want to simulate Spark? Um, HSAIL is uh, AMD's GPU um, intermediate language, and that is works for AMD's GPU model. Um, they seem to think it works. I've never used it. So. What company or companies are supporting Gem5? I noticed that there's Google source stuff. I mean, there's no, no companies are giving money to Gem5. Okay. Um, if any of you work for a company and want to give us money, uh, I don't think any of you do. You mentioned that ARM people are actively using it, so presumably they're contributing back to the... Yeah, that's a good question. So ARM contributes a lot to Gem5. ARM research contributes a lot to Gem5. Um, AMD uses Gem5 a lot. They contribute some. Google is using Gem5, um, and there is a couple of Google employees that are contributing. Uh, who else? Micron has contributed some. They use Gem5. Uh, um, there's one, I can't remember the, there's a startup in Europe that uses it that's been contributing. Um, and I know tons of other companies use it, but don't necessarily contribute back. That's a good question. Okay. Um, so within source arch is where all of the ISA stuff is. So if you look in x86, there's a bunch of files. Um, most of them are either devices for that specific architecture, ISA specific objects, like each ISA has its own TLB because the TLB is very ISA specific. They have these system interfaces, which we'll talk a little bit more about when we talk about um, SE versus FS mode. And then the most important part in there is the ISA definition, um, which I have a slide on. So if you look in source arch, say x86 ISA, you'll see all these .isa files. So this is a domain specific language that's just used within Gem5 to um, define the ISA in a generic way so every CPU model can use so each CPU model can be used with any ISA. Any ISA can be used with any CPU model. Um, it's written in the, the compiler, compiler for this language is written in Python, um, but the language is not very easy to understand. Um, it doesn't have a lot of documentation. However, if you ever need to dig into it and try to figure out what's going on, you know, I would suggest looking at the generated output so if you look in build x86 generated, there's a bunch, there's like a bunch of decoder files, and you can look there to see what the I, what C++ code the ISA language generates. Then usually you can take that and then go backwards and try to find it um, in the ISA language. There are a few wiki pages that are somewhat There are some wiki pages on it, um, which are helpful. So uh, the most important pieces are the decoder which takes in the bits of an instruction and then figures out which instruction to create. And then the actual implementation. And these implementations create a static instruction class. And these static instructions, as we'll see when we get to the CPU, how the CPU executes, the CPU gets a static instruction from the decoder and then executes on this static instruction. And so whatever the ISA 
defines in that static instruction is what the CPU is executing. Um, so the static instruction defines what kind of instruction is. So it has these functions like is an OOP, is it integer, is it a memory operation. And then it provides these four functions. Execute, which is like if it's an add instruction, the execute would take two registers and modify a third register. Um, if it was a multiply, it would do a multiply. If it was you know, whatever else kind of instruction you have, the execute is what does the instruction. Um, then there's, for memory references, it's a little bit different because for a memory reference, you have to calculate the effective address, send a request, and get a response. So in initiate access, you, ca you, cons you, you calculate the effective address and get everything ready to make a memory request. Then in complete access, um, this is kind of like the execute for the memory instructions. This is where the memory um, instruction writes into registers. I mean, it's incomplete access. And then finally, each in, uh, instruction gives a way to advance the PC to the next PC because stupid ISOs like x86 have variable length instructions and you don't necessarily know. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Well, that, that's true. That's not what advanced PC does. Advanced PC is um, for branches would advance to the target if um, the branch was taken or advance to the next instruction if it wasn't. Yeah. Yes, I can try. Um, I haven't looked deeply into how branches work, to be honest. Um, I think it's, so I'm not sure what to do or uh, how, let me make sure to say true statements. So advanced to PC definitely looks um, and either advances to the target of the branch if it's taken or does or advances to the next instruction if it's not taken. Um, I think execute probably does the compare and save some information. So, so, well, I mean, whatever the branch is branching on, the execute will do whatever the um, execute, like what happens in the execute stage. So if it's um, a MIPS-like where you always compare as a greater than zero, then execute will do that. And then advanced PC will pick the next PC. Um, if it's like a, an x86 branch that just looks at a um, control register or a control flag, then execute won't really do anything, but then uh, the advanced PC will look at that control flag. Yeah? Correct uh, me if I'm wrong, but. I'm probably wrong. Is implemented as micro ops? So. So that the x86 jump instruction would actually have a few different micro ops. And one of those micro ops would be a branch. Yeah. Um, so the static instruction is a micro op. Okay, so you're, 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 you're describing the micro op right now. You're not describing it. Essentially, I'm describing the micro op. The okay. macro, we'll, we'll see in the code how macro ops break down into micro ops, which is a giant pain uh, when you're writing a CPU. But yeah, th this is the static instruction you can think of as a, um, only micro ops will have all this information about them. Macro ops are just broken down into micro ops. Yeah? So, um, are you saying that execute uh, is the, actually what, what actually happens, but advanced PC is what uh, the, the flow of execution which comes from the branch is the speculative? No, so advanced PC is non-speculative. This is all non-speculative execution of the instruction. If you want to do speculative execution, you'll have to handle that over on the side on your own somehow. So this um, static instruction comes from the decoder. We'll look at code in a minute. But you decode some bits and you get a static instruction. Then you decide what you want to do with that static instruction. You could send it through the pipeline static, uh, uh, speculatively, or you could send it through the pipeline non-speculatively, or whatever else you want to do. In the example I'm going to go through, the simple CPU, it's a single cycle CPU. Um, it doesn't do any speculative execution. Um, so say you wanted to do, if you wanted to implement a branch predictor with speculative execution, 
you would look at the PC that you're currently at, see if you want to predict it taken or not. If you want to predict it taken, then you would send the decoder the bits from that other address. So you generate a new address, a new fetch address, fetch those bits, decode it into a different static instruction, mark that static instruction speculative, and then send that down the pipe. And for what instance. Right. Okay. Um, I have not tried to implement a fully um, speculative processor yet. So I'm speaking speculatively here. Um, so this execute and advance, like all, all of these functions take in what's called an execution context, which that context could be speculative. You mean for a context? No, an execution context. Um, we'll look at it in a minute. Um, so you need to pass these, so, so the, let's see, do I have a slide on this? No, I don't. Um, I should have had a slide on this. So when you're executing, you're affecting the system state, like the registers, for instance, right? So you have to have some interface to, for the ISA to be able to call into the CPU to affect the register. And it needs to be, they're completely decoupled. And so there's this special class called execution context, which we'll look at the code in a minute. Um, and this execution context uh, wraps around the physical registers that you want to use. And so if you're doing it speculatively, you need to give that execution context speculative registers somehow you know for instance with a register rename table um, and make sure that execution context only updates speculative registers or that you only commit those registers to the physical register file at commit time it's complex though it, it, it's really complicated <laughs> for sure <laughs> yes like <laughs> speculative execution is really complicated okay so let's um, let's look at this code so to do this, unfortunately, this code is not mainline yet. So we're going to have to um, pull code from my public GitHub to get it. Um, but let's look at this code. So we're going to, if you want to follow along, you can, or you can just watch. You can see all my crappy branches that I have. All right, and then we can check out the learning simple CPU branch. Um, okay, so let's start with the um, sim object description file. So this is all in part four of um, the learning gym five code. So if we start with the sim object description file, um, it's really pretty simple. We're just going to inherit from base CPU and then uh, define our uh, memory mode, which we'll talk more about memory modes in, in a bit. So that's all we have to do in the sim object description file. Now in the header, Um, so we first have a port. So we have a master port so we can send requests into the memory system. And this is really similar to the um, master port that we saw in the simple memory object. It's again really simple flow control. It doesn't necessarily allow uh, multiple outstanding requests. Does, definitely doesn't allow multiple outstanding requests. Um, we'll look at this in a second, but I'm going to use this uh, memory request class that I created to try to encapsulate all of these things you have to do with memory um, when you're dealing with CPUs, which 
especially in x86, ends up getting complex because x86 supports um, non-aligned loads. So you can have loads that cross cache boundaries, which are a major pain. Thank you, x86. Um, so again, li li like the um, like what we had before, we have inside this port a send packet func function to just deal with all of the flow control. Yeah. Yeah, so this this CPU um, has a single instruction slash data port, a unified instruction data port. And so the like a fetch will block. Well, it's a it's a single cycle CPU, so it doesn't matter. Um, Yes, you can have one master to more than one slave. Each, but so, but each slave only re receives requests for certain. Wait. No, sorry, you cannot do that. Master and slave, it's one to one. Yes. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. So we have the send packet, um, which looks a lot like what we saw before. Um, so then the other important thing is we have the CPU port that is what we use to send packets and a thread. So this simple thread, which I want to go back before I publish this and rewrite this class. Um, this is the hardware context. This is what contains the registers. This contains all of your um, control registers, this contains the current PC. Anything that's part of the hardware execution context is, in, is encapsulated inside this thread. Um, and this is our hardware context. And then there's a few other things. We have to keep track of what macro op we're executing. Uh, there's a trace to be able to get traces out, which makes it possible to um, actually big, debug the damn thing. Um, and then a few functions. So we're essentially going to have a two and a half stage pipeline. It's not really a pipe, but we're not pipelining it, but we have two and a half stages. We're going to fetch the instruction. Once we get the data, we're going to execute it. I guess we're going to decode it, so maybe we have three and a half. We're going to fetch it. We have a function to decode, um, a function to execute the instruction. And then a function of finish, finish execution, which is just advances the PC. Um, but before we can do any of that, we have to set up all this initialization for the CPU. So you have to initialize it and call base CPU in it. We have to do startup, which is um, uh, where we call base CPU startup. I'm not sure exactly. I can't remember exactly what goes on there. We'll look at the code in a second. And then activate context, which is where we start the fetch. The first fetch is an activate context. And the only other, the other couple functions we have here are uh, these finished translate functions. So we're going to need to translate from virtual to physical address. And we're going to mostly use this memory request to encapsulate it and hide it from the CPU for the most part. But the CPU still needs to deal with, once the translation, you send the request to the TLB. The TLB either translates it or walks the page table. Then the request, then the translation is finished. And the CPU still needs to look at that translation and make sure that there's not a fault. Because if there's a fault at that point, the CPU needs to deal with, how, figure out how, how to deal with the fault. Uh, and data and fetch are similar. Um, and then finally, the, the, the other function we need is a uh, function to be called once we get the data whenever we send a memory request for uh, loads and stores. Okay, so let's start with the initialization logic. 
So there's some a few weird things that we need to do. So importantly, if you're creating a CPU, you need to register the thread context um, with this thread context. Um, it's actually a vector of thread contexts in the base CPU. If you don't do this, nothing works for some reason. This might have taken me a few hours to figure out. So I will save you those few hours. Um, and then in init, you need to initialize some memory proxies. Um, startup, you need to start the thread up as well. Um, wake up, you need to support in case the CPU is uh, let's see, wake up is called I can't remember exactly when wake up is called um, sorry about that and then just a quick question because yeah. I saw that if you want to model a multi-core CPU you still have only the one CPU that is multi-core then or you have multiple instances you have multiple instances of the CPU ok and what is this um, so then, so, let's see. So for multi-core, you would have you would instantiate multiple of these CPUs. Okay. If you wanted each core to support multiple threads, ah, so like hyper-threading, you could have multiple threads I see. I see. in a CPU. Yeah, and that's why wake up is given a thread ID, so you have um, which thread on the CPU to wake up. Yeah. Uh, everything is built to be multi-core or multi-threaded, but not many of our CPU models support it well. Okay. I wouldn't trust it working. So where can we say that we don't want multi-thread? So I mean, I kind of decided that this CPU is only going to support one thread. And so if that's why I assert everywhere that TID is zero um, to make sure that it's not multi-threaded. The base CPU supports multi-threading. But ba base CPU is an abstract CPU class. And it has support for multiple threads, um, and like the in-order CPU, the minor CPU, and uh, the out-of-order CPU do have most of the code there for multi-threading support. I can't tell you if it works or not. I haven't tested it, and I know there are no tests that test it. So since I haven't tested it, and tests don't test it, I think it, it it's it could work or it could not. Okay, so then the important part is activate. So when activate is called, we're going to schedule a new um, function, or sorry, schedule a new event, which is fetch. So we're going to schedule a fetch event when um, the CPU is activated. Here's some um, implementations for the port stuff, which again is similar to the other things we were looking at. Okay, fetch. So to fetch, we're going to get the uh, instruction address, which is the current, the thread has the current PC. Um, but we need to mask it with the PC mask, or else it doesn't work right. Um, and then create a new memory request. Then we're going to call translate on this memory request. So let's take a moment and look at what this memory request, or let's not. We're going to skip that. The memory request essentially encapsulates translation and creating of packets and stuff, so the CPU logic doesn't have to worry about that. By translate, you mean something like uh, the MNU desk? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, fine. We'll look at translation because that's important. Is there a timing on the memory request? Is it assumed it immediately? Uh, there, is, there is full timing on the memory request. So that translate is translating. For a call to TLB, not translating for anything else. Yeah, so translate calls. You take the thread and get the TLB, and then you call translate timing on the TLB. Okay. That does something, and eventually calls finish. So the memory request extends base uh, uh, TLB translate translation 
base TLB translation. And then by extending that translation, you promise that you will have a finished function. And so you translate something, you call translate on the TLB, eventually that TLB will call finish on that object. And so that might be in the same cycle if it's a hit, or it might be, you know, 300 cycles later if it was a miss and you had to walk the page table. Granted, this is, the CPU only works in SC mode, so you'll never have to walk the page table, um, but in FS mode, you might have to walk the page table. So then in finish, it has a bunch of extra code for dealing with uh, requests that are across cache line boundaries. But if you ignore that and just look down here, if it's an instruction fetch, then it calls the CPU finish fetch translate. Otherwise, it calls um, finish data translate. So we can go back to the CPU. Um, and look for finish fetch translate. So we called request translate here. And then once it's finished translating, it calls finish fetch translate. And so we check to see if there is a translation fault. And if there was, we die right now. The CPU does not support um, translation faults in instructions. Um, otherwise, uh, we send the request. Um, and this automatically handles sending a memory request. And then sometime later, once that memory request finishes, it will call decode instruction with the packet that came back from memory. So, decode instruction. Um, so the steps to decode are we send this decoder, which is an ISA specific um, object, we give it bytes. We just give it some data. Um, and then we try to decode based on that data. Um, for most ISAs, this would be like four bytes of data. Then we would decode and give an instruction. For x86, it's possible that we don't have enough data to decode the instruction, and we need to send another memory request to get that data. So that's what all this code is down here, is if we didn't get a valid instruction out of the decoder, then we need to schedule another fetch event to get the next n bytes of data. So did I understand it right that you implement the CPU model independent of the instruction set? Yep, the CPU model is completely independent of the ISA. So a CPU model needs to support both micro ops for x86 and this silly decoding thing for x86 with variable length instructions, as well as anything else. Um, but for uh, risk five and ARM, you would never take this code path. Um, okay, so once we've decoded the instruction, we have a static instruction, great. We can update the thread state and call execute instruction, and we can actually execute the instruction. Then in execute instruction, um, most of this I'll come back to this in a second. Excuse me. Yeah. What do you do in updating thread state? I'm sorry? Uh, what do you do when updating the thread state? With the next you know, I wish I could really explain to you why you have to do that. I don't know. It's just code that I copied from other CPU models to get it to work. Yeah, I would guess that you somehow need to increase the PC in something like this. This does not increment the PC at this point. That doesn't happen until um, finish instruction, or finish, finish execute. And maybe it determines the PC when this, the PC is I think I think this actually the... sets the PC to the current PC of this instruction. Okay. I think. I, 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 I'm not sure exactly. Okay. Um, that, that's why I was saying I, I really need to understand this thread state better before I um, write this section. Okay, so then we execute the instruction, which essentially is 
Um, if it's a memory reference, then we call it initiate access on the instruction. So this is one of those um, functions that's auto that, that, that the ISA implements for us. If it's not a memory instruction, we just call execute. And what we do is we pass in this execution context, as I was saying. So this execution context is what wraps in this case, it's just wrapping our thread state and allows the um, ISA to call functions to update registers or to read registers. So if you look at the execution context code, um, it's just this giant code that all it does is read register, you know, the function is like read register and it calls simple thread read, read register. It's write register, it calls simple thread write register. Um, if you had an out-of-order CPU or did speculation, then in the execution context when you said read register, you would have to do your virtual, your um, uh, logical to physical register um, translation to get at the right register. Does that make sense? Whatever your rename table has for that particular execution context would need to be stored with it. Um, Okay, so you know, for the memory reference, we initiate access, and we'll look a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and then there's a bunch of other stuff here to deal with macro ops versus micro ops. And so you might have to flip down into and start fetching. The new instruction might actually be from a micro op and from a micro PC, not from the current macro op or macro PC. Um, Microprogram things are terrible. Uh, right, okay, so memory operations, we're gonna call initiate access. Um, and so I guess I'll actually show you in this execution context. Um, So the in initiate access inside our ISA description or ISA definition is a function which calls the execution um, context initiate memory or initiate memwrite or initiate memory or write mem. And then we get to, as our CPU model, define these functions with how we want the CPU to act whenever we're doing these two things. And so in this case, we're simply gonna create a new memory request and call translate on it and let the system deal with it from there. So does that make sense? Is this clear the way we're jumping back and forth between things that are implemented in the ISA versus things we implement inside of our CPU? Somewhat. Okay. You're staring at me with uh, slightly more blank faces than I get in my undergrad classes. Slightly more. Right. Okay. Um, so this creates the memory request we call translate and then eventually that calls finish translate. The finish translate, if it's a fault, so if it's a translation fault, um, rather than trying to, say, produce a seg fault, we just panic and say the CPU doesn't know how to deal with uh, translation faults. Um, otherwise, we call request send. And then the other step in between are dealing with special kinds of um, memory accesses which are not explicitly modeled in Jim5, they're just emulated. Um, so they call send eventually the memory system you send out the memory request it'll come back and it calls uh, get data response here so again you create an execution context and call complete access which then writes the data from memory into registers um, and then finally we can call finish execute which if something is faulted then we reset the decoder and jump to that faulting PC. Um, otherwise, we just update the PC to be the next PC. 
And if we're currently on a micro PC, it becomes very complicated. Otherwise, um, we initiate a new fetch and start over. So that is a very quick overview of a CPU model. So I have a small question. Yeah. Where does this uh, division of macro op into micro op happens? So that happens in the, let's see, when we're executing, if it is a macro op, then we fetch the next micro op and get that static instruction. And then execute this instruction. Then down here in finish, execute, if we're currently working on a micro op, then we schedule another execute, which will do the next micro op until we're at the last micro op. And, and so we don't need to fetch since we're just getting stuff out of the micro, the micro coded, uh, the micro op. Macro op, right? Like we're right. Getting we're breaking the, mac the macro op down, yeah. And, and who annotates, uh, like, is it It's in the ISA definition. So if we look at, um, let's try to do something that I am, I was looking at recently. Uh, I don't know. Let's look at jump. So this jump micro op consists of three, the jump macro op consists of three micro ops to read the instruction pointer, load immediate, and then write the instruction pointer. And so these three micro ops, will, it'll break, when we get to this macro op jump, we will start reading from this new micro PC. So and execute these three. And that actually, the way this code is written in the simple CPU all happens in a single cycle, except for the memory operation. Yeah. So maybe this is my misunderstanding, but when I was reading through the ISA stuff, trying to make sense of some of these, why do you have to read the instruction pointer in the first place? I, I don't, I can't answer that. Um, okay. Right. Yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, I, I think it, it could be um, to set control flags. In x86, when you do, a lot of times when you do load or read a register, it sets control flags for that, right? like based on that register value. So it could be for setting control flags. I could, I, I, that, that's my own speculation. So, does this also mean that in that file we can insert our own instruction and with different micro ops to perform it? Yeah, I wish I had more details on how to do, um, how to implement new instructions. Um, but that's not, not something I'm prepared to talk about right now. <laughs> it's, it, it's hard, yeah. So, yeah, so when you call, um, so the instruction cache will be accessed uh, in here. So after you translate, you're going to call send on the memory request. So this, if we look at memory request, and I mean, it's a little bit convoluted, but Uh, da, 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 da. So, in send fetch, we're going to create a new packet, allocate it, get the port, the instruction port that we're going to send it across, and then call send packet. Um, 
and this port is you know whatever we implemented, and that can be connected to anything we want. It could be connect connected to a cache, connected directly to memory, connected to any memory object we want. So it could be connected to that simple mem object that we made, for instance. It's just sent across a port. So it can, um, so the CPU has, the base CPU has two ports, an instruction port and a data port. And so it sends instructions across the instruction, well, by um, convention, it sends instructions across the instruction port and data across the data port. It doesn't have to, though. Like, you can you do whatever you want. Yeah, so a lot of this code, um, and this is you know the downside of not going through it line by line, because this send packet is a function that I created right here mm -hmm. in this code. It's not a gem5 intrinsic function. You know, the only gem5 intrinsic function that we're using is send timing request, which is being hidden in this send packet. Um, yeah, so that's, you know, by calling send packet, we're going to send a request into the memory system. And eventually we'll get a receive timing request back, which we'll call receive response. And in receive response, we either call CPU decode or data response, depending on if it's an instruction or data uh, memory request. Does that make sense? Okay, I think I have a few slides that talk about these things and then I'll ask if there are any other questions. Okay, so, you know, the, the CPU is a little bit confusing because I'm using a single port instead of having separate um, instruction and data ports. Um, we talked about the simple thread as the, this hardware context for us. We have to override all these um, virtual functions in the CPU. Talked about the memory request um, and the way it kind of hides a lot of the memory stuff when you're accessing. Um, and you know, the memory request is a step towards having a load, load store unit. When essentially what you want is an interface where you just kind of send a memory, you know, send something over to the load store unit that tracks everything out to memory and eventually calls back into the pipeline whenever it's done. And that's a step in, the, in that direction. We talked about fetching decoding, executing, and then at the end we finally implement the PC. Um, so any questions about the simple CPU? Any other questions? And then I'll talk about some of the other CPU models. I have a yeah. small follow up probably not directly related to simple CPU. Is that about cross compilation? So for example, if I have ARM CPU which is well tested and I have a x86 yeah. binary, is it possible to? No. Mm -hmm. So you have to cross compile your workload. So I mean, are tools present at oh. Gem5 Wiki to no. cross compile x86? So for ARM, there's actually, they have, um, if you search for ARM research enablement, they have a how-to with how to set everything up for ARM. How to set up the cross-compiler and everything. Um, but it's actually not that hard. If you just search for like ARM cross-compiler, it's pretty straightforward to set up. And there's also cross-compilers for RISC, it's RISC-V as well. Um, I would suggest using a Docker container. Docker container. I would put my cross-compiler inside a container. That way you don't pollute your um, your computer with a bunch of cross like weird GCCs that don't produce x86 code. Or you have to go to the system. Yeah. I like Docker though. It's nice and contained. <laughs> Any other questions here? All right. Sorry for going over things like this kind of superficially. I know. But we're kind of at the wrong level between detailed and superficial. I recognize that. Okay, so the other CPU models. So Gen5 exposes is a really flexible CPU interface. So all the CPU has to do is understand how to call, like get a static instruction 
and call execute initiate access um, on this static instruction. And so you can really build any kind of CPU model around that. So the one of the simplest is the atomic CPU. So this actually doesn't do timing. The atomic will call into the memory system uses, using atomic memory mode, which just goes through a set of functions. You never enqueue an event when you're in atomic mode, almost never. So if I did an atomic memory read from the CPU, it would call a function, it would call send atomic on the cache. The cache would call send atomic on the next level cache, which would call send atomic on the memory. And then the memory would get the data and then you would have all these returns. And so it'd be like one stack to get the data. There's no events or anything to simulate any timing when you're using atomic mode. So this is good because you don't have all these extra events and so it's much faster. And you can actually warm up your cache here or fast forward your application to the region of interest in atomic mode using the atomic CPU. There's the time assembly, timing simple CPU, um, which is a single cycle CPU. It's like the simple CPU we were just looking at. Um, every request has takes one cycle to execute, except for memory operations, which take however long the memory system takes to um, get them back. And there's no memory level parallelism. You'll only have one CPU, uh, one memory request out at a time. There's the out of order CPU, which is incredibly configurable, um, also pretty easy to abuse. I think I was talking to somebody at lunch that the defaults on the out of order CPU are just completely random and don't mean anything. So if you're going to use the out of order CPU, I strongly encourage you to understand what the different parameters are doing and set the parameters to what is reasonable for the system you're running. By default, it's like eight way out of order. And there are no systems, hardly any systems, that are eight way out of order. So you need to think about what um, different parameters to set when you're using the out of order CPU. There's the minor CPU, which we should probably rename to be in order. Um, and it's an in order CPU that, I think it's like a four stage in order CPU um, that came out of ARM research. Take it as you will that ARM research produced this. Hint, hint. It's relatively, I mean, it's, it, it closely models ARMs in order devices. Um, so it's, it's really good if you, you're wanting to model a low power ARM chip. The minor, the minor CPU does a good job. Um, it's not fully tested with x86. I've had pretty good luck running x86 on a minor CPU. I haven't run into any major issues. And then there's uh, the KVM CPU, which um, is really great. So uh, KVM is, yeah. How would you know if you had run into issues necessarily? I check the output of my benchmarks usually to make sure that it matches the output that it should. And if the output matches native execution, I trust that the CPU executed it correctly. So what types of issues, would you say they're not really test for a particular construction set? What types of issues would you generally have with Oh, is well, so the, since... Is just the issues that x86 does things that no one else does? It's the issue that x86 does things no one else does, and you might get a crash when you're running it. Or something like the wrong the, the wrong results after you run it. Okay. Yeah. It's just not, it, it hasn't been highly tested with x86. So, um, so the KVC, KVM CPU is really great. Um, it's a completely, it, it's a completely different kind of CPU model from everything else. So KVM is the kernel virtual machine. It is a hypervisor um, that allows you to run Say another, you know, like Zen uses it. You can run another operating system inside Linux using the hardware virtualization support of your CPU. So our CPUs can emulate a CPU. So why not use that CPU, that emulated CPU in the kernel virtual machine, as the CPU model for Gem5? So by using this hardware virtualization, you can actually run Gem5 at native speed because you're using the native hardware as your CPU model. So what this means is that if you're running in KVM, it's exactly like running 
in um, Zen or running in QMU with KVM. Uh, it just it runs on the hardware, and Gem5 is the hypervisor. And so this is really great for, um, you know, it, it makes it where you can switch kernels really easily because it takes literally 10 seconds to boot Linux when you're running with the KVM CPU. So you can boot up with the KVM CPU, play around, you know, you can use the Telnet to Telnet in and um, get all your systems set up the way you want and then switch into detailed mode um, by switching CPUs. So you can switch between these CPUs models dynamically as well. Um, and it works, so KVM will only work though on x86 and ARM if your native environment is the same as your simulated environment. So if you want to run ARM KVM, you have to have an ARM dev board um, or some kind of ARM processor which supports KVM to run Gen 5. Maybe this would be a good reason to buy a KVM machine. So I still don't understand, like, is there like an example in this case uh, that's the way I run all my simulations. So I run KVM CPU. So um, I set up my simulations such that I uh, so so the simulation will boot Linux, then initialize an application, start running the application, and then the application is uh, I compile the application with region of interest markers. Um, which, when it gets to a region, when Gem5 sees a region of interest marker, it will stop the simulation loop. It generates an exit event, and so I break out of inbox and loop. So I use KVM to boot Linux and set everything up and initialize the workload. When it gets to the beginning of the region of interest, it exits out of the M5 simulate loop. I call switch CPU to switch from KVM into, say, the atomic CPU. Then I cache warm up for a while. And then after some amount of time, I exit again, and then switch into O3 to run my simulation. How does it work in conjunction with the memory? Because the uh, virtualization layer will need to use the native memory of the machine. Yeah. So, memory. right. So there are three different memory modes in Gym 5. Timing, which is mostly what we've been talking about, which is where all the timing is modeled for the memory modes. Atomic, which I mentioned, doesn't have any timing. Um, some structures are warmed up, not all structures. If you are using atomic and you need your structure to be warmed up, you should check the receive atomic function and make sure that it actually warms it up. And then there's atomic non-caching, which is used for KVM. And this completely bypasses all the caches in the system and directly accesses a memory mapped region, which is where Gem 5's physical memory is. Yeah. So you can switch between atomic non-caching and timing? You can switch between all three modes. All you have to do is drain everything. So if you want to switch from atomic non-caching to timing, it's really straightforward. You can just switch into timing and everything's okay. If you want to switch from timing to atomic non-caching, then you need to make sure that no events are currently in the event queue. So you have to drain, you have to drain timing first. You have to drain everything out of the event queue, and then you also have to flush everything out of your caches. Um, or at least flush any modified data out of the caches into uh, your backing memory before you can start using atomic non-caching. Now is that then, do you basically disconnect your caches from the ports as part of that switch or does the memory system somehow just bypass the caches? So the memory system just, currently it's implemented as the memory system bypasses the caches. I have a set of patches that does the other thing which disconnects all the ports and then reconnects different ports. Um, those patches aren't in Gen 5 yet. I don't know if they ever will be. I think a better I think a better way to look at it is disconnect and reconnect, uh, but that's just personal. Which I guess means that if you want to implement a cache, you have to implement whatever logic onto that cache so that it knows how to disconnect itself. Uh, no, you can you can implement it generally. And uh, that logic is built in somewhere. Okay. Yeah. So the minor CPU is uh, has a four-stage pipeline, so it's pipelined. Um, it has a branch predictor. It does um, some amount of speculation, although it's in order, so not a huge amount. Um, and it has it allows multiple memory requests to be outstanding. I think it has two 
Um, I think it's actually a two-way issue. And I think it can have up to two memory requests outstanding at a time. Um, so there's a little bit of memory level parallelism to it. And it takes some number of cycles to go through. Different instructions will take different number of cycles. So multiplies take longer than adds. Um, it's a variable length pipeline. It looks like what an ARM in order core looks like. Have you had to make any changes to work with SO physics or with minor? No, I think it works. It's not fully tested. It's not tested a lot. But my experience has been that it works. Yeah? Um, let's say you warm up with atomic symbol, and then you somehow take a checkpoint and kind of store with the uh, OP3. So is a cache that preserved? OK, so that's, uh, that's a good question. Yes and no. So if you're using Ruby, yes. The Ruby caches are dumped on a checkpoint. That comes with a lot of caveats, but they are stored on a checkpoint. Um, the classic caches are not stored. So the classic caches are flushed out to memory, and then memory is stored. Um, but you always have to warm up with the classic caches. So is it a better idea to just warm up with the top and just switch? That's what people do. Any other questions here on different Gen 5 CPU models? OK, so we have the three memory modes we talked about. Oh, and questions. So we talked about how ISAs work. We talked about how CPUs execute. And we looked at some detail of the uh, learning simple CPU. Um, and then Gen 5's CPU models and memory modes. So any general questions?